schedule. So I really, really appreciate you being here. Um, before we get started, I want to open up the space with the land acknowledgement. Uh, literary Arts is based in Portland, Oregon, and we are currently on unceded land. The Multnomah, Kathamit, Clackamas, Tumwater, Wallala Bands, the Tualatin Kalpuya, and many other indigenous nations of the Columbia River occupied and operated on this land long before Western colonizers arrived, and many continue to do so today. Despite attempts of removal and erasure, these communities remain a strong and vital part of our future. Literary Arts recognizes that this acknowledgement is only a small step in affirming the ongoing presence and contributions of our Native communities, and we commit to engaging these communities more fully as we fulfill our mission. For those of you who are not familiar with Literary Arts, we are a nonprofit community-based arts organization with a 37-year history of serving readers and writers. Our mission is to engage readers, support writers, and to inspire the next generation with great literature. Our programs include Portland Arts and Lectures, programs for youth, the Oregon Book Awards and Fellowships Program, and the Portland Book Festival. We also offer reader seminars, writing classes, and free literary events like this one year round. Um, our Oregon Book Awards ceremony will be held in person this year at the Armory on Monday, April 25th. For tickets and more information, head over to literary-arts.org. And I can put that in the chat. Because websites are weird. <laughs> Again, thank you all for being here. Um, just as a little reminder of how the night will go, I will introduce a reader. They will come up and share their wonderful work. Um, and we'll do that. I'll keep introducing and then a person will read, introduce, a person will read. And then when we're done, um, we'll have time for questions from the audience. Um, if you have a question, there is a Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen. Feel free to put it in there, but if you put it in the chat, I will also catch it um, and I will ask those out loud. Uh, great. That sound good? Thank you to our finalists for being here. Uh, I'm going to ask you all to turn off your camera, except for Bryna, who is going first. Thank you, thank you. And then we'll all come back at the end. All righty, Bryna Goodman is a professor of history at the University of Oregon. Her recent work maps globally circulating institutions and categories of knowledge in modern China with particular attention to print, media, gender, urban culture, and political life. Thanks for being here. Thank you very much. It's an honor to be here in this company. Uh, my book got its start many years ago uh, when I came upon a, a perplexing suicide case in some Shanghai records. I couldn't figure it out at the time, so I ended up tracing it in Chinese archives, uh, uh, Japanese archives, British and French archives, uh, and also um, the National Archives in Washington and some private papers. Uh, I'm just going to uh, begin at the beginning. On the evening of September 8, 1922, the body of a 24-year-old female clerk named Xi Zhen was found hanging in the office of the Chinese newspaper, the Journal of Commerce. The building was located in Shanghai's international settlement, the Anglo-American dominated enclave that constituted one territorial authority in a city of multiple and fragmented jurisdictions. A graduate of a progressive uh, girls' school, she had been the first female employee of the newspaper. Prior to her employment, she taught briefly at her alma mater, alma mater and another girls' school in the city. She also wrote essays, poetry, and fiction, but published little in her name. The clerk's employer was an influential US educated businessman in his early 40s named Tang Jiezhi, the managing director of the journal. Prominent in commercial circles, Tang achieved celebrity in the popular nationalist mobilization of the May 4th movement of 1919, in which Chinese protested the terms of the Treaty of Versailles, which transferred German concessions in Shandong province to Japan, circumventing Chinese sovereignty. As the movement subsided, Tang redirected his political acumen and social and commercial ties into the establishment of a progressive newspaper. Under his leadership, the journal achieved acclaim for its critical political voice. At a moment when the entrance of women into public life was heralded 
as a sign of a new democratic era for China, the discovery of Xi's corpse in the office she shared with her employer was certainly inauspicious. Contemporary concern for the sexual integration of workplaces and Tang's reputation for championing social reform, including female employment, ensured that the news reverberated beyond the newspaper office and the social, political, and intellectual circles of both Xi and Tang. Early reports revealed that Xi's apparent suicide was also linked to a devastating Chinese stock exchange bubble that had engulfed Shanghai in the previous year. Like many in the city, Xi had invested in the market and suffered substantial losses. In the words of one observer, Xi's mother was heartbroken to think of her lively, lovable daughter dying at a young age as a result of economic oppression. The connection to the recent financial turmoil intensified media attention to the suicide. Indeed, the dynamism of Shanghai newspapers at, in this moment was itself tied to the financial exuberance of the stock exchange. Newspapers enjoyed considerable advertising revenue from the rash of stock exchanges that had sprung up in the city, uh, as the cliche had it, like bamboo shoots after a spring rain. A timely subsidy from the most prominent of these exchanges had in fact enabled the opening of the Journal of Commerce in January 1921, easing its financial challenges. Pub public preoccupation with economic news also stimulated increases in newspaper subscriptions. The combined electricity, or for some, the corrosive radioactivity of links between celebrity and finance, and the eroticization of office space that accompanied the new sexual integration would generate discussion for months in Shanghai's print media, tea houses, and offices, uh, activating the pens of Shanghai's literary lights and members of the nationalist and young communist parties. The discovery of Xi's corpse also set in motion a surprising chain of events. Tang was arrested, placed on trial for financial fraud, and sentenced to prison. Some would see this as Tang's just dessert and Xi's cosmic revenge on her tormentor. Such commentators hailed Xi as a new woman and a martyr to the cause of women's independent livelihoods. Others framed her choice to end her life as a regrettable weakness of character, evidence of women's frailty and unsuitability as self-determining citizens. Whereas some writers who called attention to Xi's recent losses on the stock exchange suggested that she had been foolish in her investments and susceptible to the temptations of the market, others described what happened as a crime of capitalism. Still others, Tang's defenders among them, understood the unfolding events quite differently as a miscarriage of justice and a silencing of public speech, another nail in the coffin of China's early 20th century republic and a betrayal of the principles of popular sovereignty in their formative moment. The circumstances of Xi Shangzhen's suicide and the events it unleashed are crucial to understanding why and how, for the arbiters of Shanghai society, this suicide so greatly shook public opinion that in the course of the tremendous social furor that ensued, not a pen remained dry. Some facts were quickly established. Others were mysterious, hinted at only in rumors, silences, odd behavior, and peculiar choices of words. Further material, some of it possibly manufactured, was unearthed, attested, and contested in investigations undertaken by journalists, public associations, and the Chinese court in the weeks and months that followed. A preliminary narrative of what happened on the evening of September 8 took shape almost immediately. Journal employees customarily ate supper together each evening at 5 p.m. When she failed to appear, Wang Jipu, an older member of staff, uh, dropped by her desk. She explained that she felt ill and had no appetite. Her pallor and something about her manner worried him. When she brushed off his suggestion that she go home, he left and some, sent someone to alert her family. The unmarried Xi lived with her family on a lane in the old Chinese city, the formerly walled core of the urban conglomeration that comprised modern Shanghai. To get there from the newspaper office, a person needed to walk south through the grid of streets in the international settlement, traverse the avenues of the French concession, and navigate the dense maze of alleyways that wound through the old city. 
not long after Wang sent his underling on this mission, probably around 6 p.m. She closed the office door, mounted a chair, slipped an electric tea kettle cord through a metal ring near the window, placed her head through the loop, and stepped into the air. She's poised as she balanced on the chair, grasping with both hands the cord on which she would hang herself is imaginatively portrayed in a woodblock print that was published shortly after her suicide. She's family was eating supper when the messenger arrived, either because he didn't indicate that the matter was urgent or perhaps because interactions with Xi's office were not out of the ordinary, Xi's sister finished her meal before making her way to the newspaper. When she arrived, not less than an hour later, she found the office door locked and it was necessary to call for Chen Aliu, the gatekeeper, to fetch a key. Chen opened the door and stood aside, revealing Xi dangling in front of the window frame. Several employees who had gathered in the doorway lifted Xi's body loosed the cord from her neck and gently laid her down. A Dr. Zhang, who was summoned to the scene from St. Luke's Hospital, pronounced she dead at approximately 8 p.m. Tang Jiezhi was not present at the discovery of Xi's body. Although his newspaper was published in Chinese and staffed almost entirely by Chinese, Tang had a Western partner, a man he had met a few years earlier through common connections with student activists. According to a police report at the Shanghai Municipal Archives, it was this foreigner, the Russian Jewish American journalist, George Sokolsky, who telephoned the police to report the hanging, a detail that was omitted in the published accounts. It may have been that Sokolsky was the highest ranking newspaper employee on the scene. English language letterhead for the journal, which identifies Sokolsky as treasurer, survives in Sokolsky's archived papers at the Hoover Institution on the campus of Stanford University. It may have also been more convenient for Sokolsky as a Westerner to place the call to the international settlement police than for a Chinese employee. Whatever the reason for his involvement at the scene, however, Xi's suicide rattled Sokolsky. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bryna. I want to hear more. I'm intrigued. <laughs> Just on a cliffhanger there. <laughs> All right, now we are welcoming Jacob Hamblin. There you are. Hi, Jacob. Uh, Jacob Hamlin is professor of history at Oregon State University. His books include Poison in the Well, Radioactive Waste in the Oceans and at the Dawn of the Nuclear Age. Oceanographers and the Cold War, and the award-winning Arming Mother Nature, The Birth of Catastrophic Environmentalism. Thanks for being here. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here uh, and such esteemed company. I don't often do readings, so uh, forgive me if I do it wrong, but I think I'm just going to read. Um, I do want to say this, uh, you know, the book itself, uh, The Wretched Atom, uh, this is it right here, uh, is uh, the post colon title is America's Global Gamble with Peaceful Nuclear Technology. But the idea of the book is to tell a history of the promotion of atomic nuclear technologies uh, in the developing world. So it doesn't isn't just uh, nuclear power, but things like mutation plant breeding, sterilization of uh, insects, grain irradiation, food irradiation, medicine, all kinds of things. Uh, that's just a little bit of context. I also use a word. Uh, frequently in the, what I'm about to read that I should explain, I use the word cornucopian, which most of you probably have heard the term, but it refers to the horn of plenty from, uh, uh, from ancient Greek mythology, at, where, where you have fruits and grains spilling out of it. So a cornucopian version of something would be one that promises plenty. Um, and with that, I am not going to start at the beginning. I'm going to start at the end. So this is from the conclusion uh, of the book. The story of Ronald Silo who in the 1960s had a total career meltdown, uh, transforming himself from a respected international bureaucrat into a professional pariah appeared earlier in this book. I discovered his story while conducting research in the archives of the Food and Agriculture Organization, uh, or FAO, in Rome. The helpful archivist noted as an aside that there might be some information in Dr. Silo's files. And when he brought them to me, I was astonished at their volume, thick folders, 
filled to the brim, but even more stunned by what I found inside. Instead of the staid formal correspondence uh, and project reports typical of FAO material, I found Silo's handwritten letters, poorly edited, sometimes with entire paragraphs crossed out. His letters were extremely long, often 20 to 40 pages in length, written to the directors general of both FAO and the International Atomic Energy Agency, or IAEA. Their contents were filled with accusations of corruption, incompetence, and unethical practices. The gist of CELO's critique was that development projects in the poorest countries of the world had been hijacked by the International Atomic Energy Agency and its richest sponsors, which made false claims about the role of atomic energy in helping to increase food supplies. CELO believed his own organization was a sham run by ideologues more interested in identifying success stories in the nuclear realm than trying to find the most promising ways to help uh, other countries solve their very real problems. Although CELO's story did not persuade me that the IAEA was a wholly corrupt organization, it did compel me to rethink the importance of atomic energy's cornucopian message and to ask how it touched broader themes of history, such as Cold War geopolitics or the post-colonial world order. Was there something to learn about the way atomic energy was presented to those countries with natural resource shortfalls or that were constantly threatened by population pressure, famine, or disease? And how did those countries, some emerging from recent defeat like Japan or from years of colonial rule like India or Ghana, themselves use the promise of atomic energy? Previously, I thought about atomic energy as primarily an issue about electricity, environmental issues, and social justice. Separately, I thought of nuclear weapons and proliferation in terms of diplomacy, statecraft, and arms control. Like many people, I understood that there were stark differences in the ways that pro or anti-nuclear energy advocates cast environmental and natural resource questions, but I had not considered how deeply embedded such ideas were in the policies and actions of governments as they pursued strategic goals around the world. France Fanon warned in the 1960s that the wretched or damned of the earth would be offered dreams of rapid advance and of economic miracles. That surely has been true of the atom. The promise of plenty was not only tempting to poorer countries, but it was also at the core of the atom's appeal as an instrument of geopolitical influence and power. In highlighting this point, this book has emphasized four interrelated themes. One is that atomic energy's future has been a pliable idea. Governments reshaped it according to their strategic needs, often in the pursuit of controlling the Earth's natural resources. The United States did it when urging governments to adopt radioisotopes in the 1950s or nuclear reactors in the 1970s, at one turn protecting access to uranium for the US weapons arsenal, and at another trying to break some developing countries' dominance of the world's oil supplies. Another theme is that the so-called peaceful atom relied on a constructive, bountiful vision that called for the reshaping of nature according to human needs, in opposition to one emphasizing harm from environmental contamination. Both were environmental narratives, but they collided repeatedly. Time and again, only the cornucopian narrative proved itself a reliable instrument of governments. A third theme is that the promise of plenty often had political value out of proportion to the economic worth or techn technical feasibility. Indeed, sometimes the latter two never materialized at all. Atoms for Peace began purely as propaganda and the purported peaceful applications of atomic energy were based on aspirations. Many of the projects discussed in this book, miracle grains in India, transformation of desert landscapes in Israel, just to mention two, were not based on proven techniques and they turned out to be mirages. They existed for other purposes, such as prestige, geopolitical leverage, distraction from bomb tests, or even concealment of new bomb programs. They were not necessarily and never, indeed never needed to be based on reality. 
Perhaps most important of all the themes is the evolution of international bodies and treaties into, into instruments of manipulation and control, reminiscent of the, control, the colonial era. At the close of the century, the world's nuclear order still divided the global north from the global south. Cooperation in the nuclear field that drew in developing countries were designed by Europeans and North Americans. Racial politics permeated the International Atomic Energy Agency from the start, despite its reputation as being purely technical. And the most acrimonious disputes were not between East and West, but between the predominantly white countries and those of the so-called developing world. In the case of the IAEA, what began as a promise of sharing peaceful atomic energy to remake nature, to outrun natural pressures, and to escape environmental threats served as an instrument for concentrating power in the hands of Europeans and North Americans. That was the wretched atom, the continued consolidation of geopolitical power and influence clothed as a utopian future. What can we conclude from this history of atomic energy solutions in the developing world promoted by the United States, its political allies and international agencies? By reframing our understanding of nuclear issues, we can see more clearly the intersection of the so-called peaceful atom with seemingly disconnected topics, including racism, colonialism and neocolonialism, propaganda, surveillance and control, weapons programs, and war. When we acknowledge these connections, the centrality of a narrative of plenty emerges, one that counts on remaking nature, quickening its pulse, or avoiding environmental dangers as an unmistakable feature of atomic energy when pursued by governments. If that is the case, we must begin to acknowledge that these particular ideas are deeply embedded in the same range of difficult and ugly questions. The cornucopian promise of the atom has been an extraordinarily useful instrument of power. It was not a marginal issue in the global nuclear order. Instead, it has been the one indispensable piece of it. Thanks. Thank you, Jacob. Cornucopian. I'm gonna try to <laughs> put that in my day to day. <laughs> you should. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, our next reader is Annalise Hines. Hi. <laughs> Annalise is a historian at the University of Oregon. Her work has been featured on National Public Radio, the Wall Street Journal, and International Chinese Television, among others. She has lived and played, I hope I pronounce this right, Mahjong? Go, yeah, sure. There are multiple ways of pronouncing it. <laughs> In the United States and Southwestern China. Thanks, Annalise. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me here. Thanks to all the viewers for being here. Um, and I will also start at the beginning. Um, going back to Bryna's mod model there. So I'll begin right uh, as the introduction takes off. What's in a game? The tiles clatter across the table. Eight hands push and sweep them back and forth, mixing them into an erratic mass before flipping over any exposed faces to show only blank backs. The tiles are smooth and cool to the touch, small enough to be held easily with thumb against forefinger. As fingers quickly pluck tiles from the center of the table, voices punctuate the air. Nimble movements bring the tiles close to the edge of the square table, and four walls made of two layers of stacked tiles quickly take shape. A pair of hands holds two dice and rolls them in the center of the table. The Mahjong game is about to begin. Envision these players in an 1890 Shanghai courtesan house. The four men do not look up as a young woman in embroidered silk pulls aside the cloth door covering to enter the room, bringing wine with her. The men's cues hang down the backs of their long robes as they focus on calculating their points. The winner will cover half their party's bill for the evening's drink and company. A tasseled lantern hangs from the ceiling. Two other, quote, sing-song girls, also known as flowers, stand supportively behind their patrons' wooden chairs, looking over their shoulders at the bone and bamboo tiles, 
watching for wine glasses to refill and ready to whisper advice if asked. In an American household in 1921 Beijing, the table is in a living room of a traditional hutong house. Bright cushions on a black sofa sit near a Chinese desk and chair of dark wood. Two couples play mahjong together in elegant dress, the women in pressed waists and men in suits despite the heat. Wearing a long white robe, a Chinese servant, knowledgeable in English and the preferences of these foreigners, refreshes their tea and cocktails. If he plays mahjong, he does not tell them, while they delight in their knowledge of this Chinese game sweeping the foreign social scene in Beijing and Shanghai. The new fad travels to the United States, where a photographer poses four young white women, fashionably wearing bobbed hair and flowing sleeveless gowns in ornately carved Chinese chairs. The women's eyes stay focused on the tiles before them. Their photographed game will accompany the text in a 1923 instruction manual, helping introduce newcomer, newcomers to the game that is exploding in popularity across the nation. French readers will eventually view their likenesses as well in a translated edition that will compete with a cascade of other instruction manuals and media chatter about the game. On market day at a Chinese American general store in Los Angeles during the early years of the depression, a group of older men in button down shirts play at a table in the back. Their years of labor do not slow the quickness of their hands in the game they have played for almost a decade. A long wooden chest of drawers holding dried herbs stands near the front door. On other shelves are newly arrived mail, outgoing remittances from the local clientele, and the mahjong set when it is not in use. A child in a pink pinafore watches them. Later that month, she will play mahjong with her grandmother during the Chinese New Year holiday. Two decades later, players' hands mix the tiles again, now made of plastic. On a grassy lawn, four women sit around a metal card table with a quilted fabric cover. A stone's throw away, a path leads to bungalow vacation homes, all occupied by Jewish families. A coin purse rests near one of the player's sandaled feet, and a cigarette case is by her hand. Their children swim and dig for worms. Most important, they are out of sight. This game will be followed by another and another this afternoon and the next. It is summer in the Catskill Mountains of upstate New York. Mahjong is a game of the senses. The tiles hold beauty earthy tones of bone and bamboo, or yellowed butterscotch of aged plastic. They are heavy in the hand, with rounded edges rubbing against each other like river pebbles. Thumbs bump against grooves in the tiles from impossibly intricate carvings or brightly colored embossed images. Nothing else mimics the clatter of mahjong tiles running over each other on a hard table surface. Even a felt top does not entirely soften the din. Regardless of when and where the game is played, these experiences remain. They are part of what might makes Mahjong unique and are no small part of its boundary crossing appeal. Mahjong is both a cultural form and a material object that is made, bought, and bequeathed. Within the spaces between the tiles and the moments between games, distinct social cultures flourished. Despite the universal elements of how the game is played and the common feel of it, Mahjong reflected and helped express a range of meanings, especially emerging American modernity, Chinese American heritage, and Jewish American women's culture. In the holds of steamships, Mahjong traveled from China to the United States and became a quintessentially American game not in spite of, but because of its diverse manifestation. Its history of adaptation, amalgamation, and self-making offers unexpected insight into race, gender, class, and leisure in modern American culture. This book follows the history of one game to think about how, in their daily lives, individuals create and experience cultural change. Playing a game from a culture across the globe helped Americans create group identities and address issues of inclusion and exclusion. Mahjong, like other forms of leisure, 
played a significant role in the cultural transformations of the 20th century. There is no single answer to why the game was so resonant across different contexts, but the fact that it was and that it inspired rich game playing cultures connects to some of the most important themes in modern American history. It's, his, its story is a window onto three pivotal areas of change in the 20th century United States. What did it mean to become, quote, modern in the early 20th century? How did American ethnicities take shape in the years leading up to and after World War II? How did middle class women experience and shape their changing roles in society before the social revolutions of the late 20th century? How are these things related? Mahjong's history also prompts closer considerations of the meaning of leisure. Although players understood Mahjong first and foremost as a fun and challenging game, the specific social patterns they created on a broad scale had ramifications beyond any individual's conscious intent. Mahjong not only reflected larger social changes, but also allowed diverse groups to shape behaviors and ideas that had consequences of their own. Perhaps more than other popular games, Mahjong had a complex cultural journey. Its history connects American expatriates in Shanghai, Jazz Age white Americans, urban Chinese Americans in the 1930s, Japanese Americans in wartime camps, Jewish American suburban mothers, and Air Force officers' wives in the post-war era. Over time, the material game changed. Bone and bamboo mimicked ivory. Later, the new plastics preserved the heft and feel of the tile without relying on natural materials. So too, its significance shaped American understandings of Asia, the boundaries of gender and race, and ideas about leisure. Because the sets themselves carried specific visual markers as Chinese, the game could retain a certain element of foreignness, even as it became Americanized in style and form. Its associations with China were an essential part of the game's appeal, either as a new and quote exotic good or as a connection to cultural heritage. The game's adaptability created barriers as well as bridges as players pushed the evolution of distinctive Mahjong variants. Mahjong was, in essential ways, both outside and inside American culture. The link to China and the attendant American associations with difference provided an avenue for formation of simultaneous American identities, both related to and entirely independent of its Chinese origins. Mahjong players, promoters, entrepreneurs, and critics tell a broad story of American modernity. The apparent contradictions of the game as both American and foreign, modern and supposedly ancient, domestic and disruptive of domesticity, reveal the tensions that lie at the heart of modern American culture. Thank you. Thank you, Annalise. It's so good to hear from you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next up is Kenneth Helpen. Kenneth, there you are. Yeah. <laughs> Kenneth is the Philip H. Knight Professor Emeritus of Landscape Architecture at the University of Oregon. An award-winning professor, his numerous previous publications address the landscapes of Israel, Colorado, suburbia, McDonald's, memorials, movies, ranch gates, golf, garden history and theory, and the landscape architect Lawrence Halpern. Thanks for being here, Kenneth. Great. <laughs> Uh, thank you. Thank the literary, literary arts for this honor. And just listening to everyone, I think the range of topics that uh, we're all dealing with is admirable and speaks well of the, the breadth of literary arts, for sure. <clears throat> I was going to suggest everyone have a beer while watching this, but I've often told folks 
This book is about hops that flavor beer. There are lots of other books that deal with beer. This is the cover of the work. I moved to Oregon almost 50 years ago to teach landscape architecture at the University of Oregon, and I first encountered hops. Unlike any other agricultural landscape I'd witnessed, I wanted to know more about this landscape and how it came to be and began to investigate. The research took me up by five, this is the other side of the book, the book, back, the back side of the book, uh, to the Hops Archive at Oregon State University and their extraordinary collection of photographs. That was the genesis of the book, <clears throat> um, which beginning in the 18, sorry, extraordinary collection of photographs beginning in the 1880s of what I've named the Oregon Hopscape, my term for the physical environment and culture of hops and the incredibly rich relationship with people to that landscape. Each photo in the book has an accompanying caption, many of which are drawn from oral histories of this world over the past century. I'll be quoting some of them. The book begins with the plant and it's spread through Western Oregon and then traces all the stages of hop production, the creation of a hop yard or field, stringing, picking, baling, and the drying of hops. This photo shows most of those stages, the poles of the hop yards, pickers and bales being loaded, brought to a dryer just outside of Springfield. The constructed construction of a hop yard is first. The hundreds of poles are arrayed as a grid in the landscape in incredible geometry on the ground. What are hops? The Latin name is humulus lupulus, the wolf of the woods. Hops are the climbing perennial plants and the Latin name suggests its voracious twisting growth of up to 25 feet a year. Commonly called a vine, hops are in fact technically vines. Vines attach to surfaces by suckers or tendrils, while a vine climbs by twisting around a support in elliptical fashion, much like DNA. The plant's female flower, the cone, contains lupulin, a oily resin that provides the aroma and distinctive flavor to beer or ale. The history of hop growing goes back five centuries. It begins in, or in Germany, migrates across the continent, before arriving at the Pacific Northwest, where the environment of the Willamette Valley offered ideal conditions for the cultivation of hops. The 1905 Lewis and Clark Exposition in Portland helped introduce Oregon hops to the world. And by the early 20th century, Oregon rivaled Germany as a global center of production and the Willamette Valley became the self-styled hops capital of the world. Hops are grown in hop yards, the term for a field of hops. Agricultural landscapes are the visible evidence of the craft of agriculture, the honed and artful skill employed to ensure the best production. All forms of agriculture are ordering systems that create a characteristic look of the land. Hop yards are immediately recognizable by a regular grid of poles and trellises, the structures that support the stringing of hops and the growth of plants. The unique appearance of a hop yard is a consequence of a dramatic construction of an architecture and of agriculture, what I call an agritecture. This large scale and scope of poles, wires, vines, twine, and stakes presents one of the most recognizable examples of an agriculture. I think of a hop yard as essentially a vineyard on steroids. Hops are essentially originally initially grown on poles set atop small mounds. 18th century English agricultural writer William Marshall described poling, which you see here as an aesthetic pleasure of setting poles on the carefully aligned hills and admiring the symmetry that resulted. The next step is establishing, in establishing a contemporary yard is building a trellis, poles with wires attached to support growing plants. There's a geometric spacing of plants and poles resulting in a dramatic trellis landscape, a three-dimensional green grid. Hop growing is an incredibly labor-intensive enterprise. Once poles are in place and hop cuttings are planted, the next step is the stringing of the yard to support the vines. A single acre can be inclined with over a mile of cable, ultimately supporting up 20 tons of hops. Beth Ron Rowe, who lived in a hop yard near Salem, wrote, I worked in the hop ranch from the time I was able to do any side, any outside work at all. When school was out, we started with the training of the hops from the time they came up out of the ground. You have to train them around the strings that take them to the wire. Then my younger brother and I, when we were quite young, rode the sleds. Have you ever seen a hop sled? They're drawn by horses, one horse per sled. They're probably six feet high. We climbed up a ladder on the back, then went down the two rows and you train the hops. 
The Grand Pass Courier, 1937, noted, a string saver's paradise might be one of the numerous hop yards in Josephine County. Hop yards before harvest are a magnificent sight. The poles and wires disappear, and the hop yard is shrouded by garlands of green, a forest of green vines. Hops are ready for fall harvest in late August or early September. Before mechanized picking, hops were picked by hand by pickers, also known as hoppers. The harvest could last as long as a month and created a rich and incredibly diverse culture. Tens of thousands of pickers were needed for the three week long Oregon harvest. Hoppers included men, women, and children of all ages. Children started picking at age six. These photographs are all environmental portraits, people in the setting of their activity, often accompanied by the tools of their craft. The hop yard here functions as the photographer's studio. Pickers came from near and far. Many nearby towns were virtually empty during harvest time and schools closed. The numbers were daunting. For example, the small city of Independence grew to a population of 50,000. Steam growth brought pickers upriver from Portland to the hop yards. Others took hop special trains. These photo group photographs have a celebratory aspect as a permanent record of participation in the season's harvest. Look close. In many pictures, folks wrap themselves in strands of harps. This is my favorite picture. I love the multi-generational quality, the boys playing with string they gathered in the foreground, and especially the Walt Whitman lookalike seated in a chair. So who picked? In the Pacific Northwest, the original pickers were Native Americans, some arriving by canoe from far away as British Columbia. They arrived with their regalia. Ultimately, all of the state's ethnic groups, largely recent immigrants of the valley, were represented. There were Chinese Americans later joined by Japanese and Filipino work laborers. Given the racial prejudice of the day, growers in fact though preferred white workers when they were available. There were Swedes, Armenians, Volga Germans. The photographer Dorothea Lang documented pickers in Oregon and Washington for the Farm Security Administration in 1939. During the Second World War, there were Bracero laborers from Mexico. There were nuns from Mount Angel Abbey picking. There were soldiers from Camp Adair during World War II and members of the Women's Land Army. And there were co-eds as they were called then from OSU. These were the first pictures I could find with women in pants. Hop picking brought together people from all walks of life, fostering a certain democratic spirit among pickers despite their diverse motivations. The Oregonian 1970, hop fields present one striking contrast to the city. There are no social barriers. Preacher and bootblack, tradesman and farmer, factory hand and college boy pick side by side. It does them a world of good. The type ones meets every, represent every shade of mankind. This was hop time, an unusual combination of work and a unique type of leisure and social environment. Entire families camped in the countryside during harvest time, joining seasonal workers. Some growers provided housing, but most common were tent encampments, which took on the trappings of complete temporary communities. The work was hard, but for many also a social gathering, and there was entertainment in the camps with music, campfires, gambling, evening entertainment, and dancers were particularly popular. Many recall the powerful smell of hops and hearing the sound of wired down, and the vines were pulled down for picking. When baskets were full, pickers yelled bags full and they were emptied into sacks. Sacks were weighed in the field and then put into bags. And ultimately they were brought to the dryers whose ventilating cupolas sprouted from rooftops. Once dried, they were compressed into 200 pound bales for transport in the shape of giant sugar cubes. The product was then sent literally to breweries around the world to add flavor to beer. Reminiscent of longstanding traditions in England, Independence in 1927 inaugurated the original Hop Festival, also known as the Fiesta. And you see a poster uh, behind this gentleman, behind this uh, Dorothea Lang's photograph. In recent years, the festival has been reborn. If you take a trip off of I-5 within a few miles in the heart of the valley near Salem or Independence, hop yards appear. For those who follow the progress of hop yard seasonal transition, from a striking grid of poles to a forest of green vines. It is a never ending delight. Thank you.
That was incredible, Kenneth. Thank you for sharing that. I really love seeing those images. Those are super cool. Thank you so much. Okay, our next reader, last but not least. Hi, Kathleen. <laughs> Kathleen. Hi, D. Jessica. Thanks for being here. <laughs> My pleasure. Kathleen Dean Moore is a philosopher, environmental advocate, and the author, the author and co-editor of a dozen books, including Take Heart, Encouragement for Earth's Wary Lovers. Recently, she was written for films, including The Extinction Variations. In a time of terrible peril, she writes to celebrate and defend the wild, reeling world. Hi, Kathleen. Hi. It's, it's true what Kenny said. It's an incredible variety of, of books that we're learning from tonight. It's, it's really quite remarkable. And it, it raises the question, doesn't it, of, of what is the work of a, of a nonfiction writer in this wild and crazy and perilous world? Um, honestly, that's, that's a question that absolutely consumes me. You know, for the longest time, I've called myself a nature writer, even though I haven't been really clear what that means. At first, I took my cue from Mary Oliver, who said, my work is loving the world, which is mostly standing still and learning to be astonished. Well, that, that's all well and good, unless you're writing about nature during the time of the sixth extinction. And then you start thinking, well, maybe that isn't quite enough. Um, we all recognize that it took 4 million years to create birdsong. And it's taking reckless and, and extractive human expansion 50 years, only 50 years to destroy half of it. And by now, since the first Earth Day, 60% of individual mammals are gone, 60%, six out of every 10, 30 or to 38% of North American songbirds are, are gone. Shorebirds, 78% of the shorebirds are gone. So it's quite clear to me that I'm gonna write my last nature essay on a planet that is less than half as song-graced and life-drenched as the one where I began to write. It's, it, it's incomprehensible. Each time a creature dies, of course, its song dies. And each time a species ends, its songs die forever. So it's clear to me that the nonfiction writer can't just inform people about this. You have to find a way to open people's hearts without breaking them. And that's gonna take a different kind of nonfiction. And that's what I want to read tonight. Um, I'll be reading from Earth's Wild Music, can you see it? Celebrating and defending the songs of the natural world. I've chosen to read three very, very short pieces. I have, have dramatically extracted stories out of this book. Um, into two minute, two minute segments. And so I thought I would read three different two minute excerpts. One about the common mirror, a coastal songbird in or uh, a coastal species in Oregon. Uh, one about the Western sage grouse, which we have in Eastern Oregon. And one about wolf pups, which we increasingly have as well. So the first one that I'll read is called the common mirror. Wearing a yellow raincoat, a boy wandered the beach between the high tide line and the falling tide. He leaned over now and then to drop a treasure into his blue bucket. The little boy was whistling. Whenever he's content, he is whistling. The sandpipers piped, a gull threw back her head and brayed. The bellboy chimed. I sat on a drift log grinning as the voices came together to shake the air into something lovely and pure. But the boy suddenly paused and took a few steps backward. His whistling stopped. With his plastic shovel, the boy dug at a disheveled black form matted in blown sand. It took him several tries to pry it into his bucket. I went to him as he turned toward me. What he had in his bucket was the limp body of a black and white seabird, a common mirror. Mirrors have always been one of the most numerous of marine birds, maybe 13 to 24 million at their peak. But now, 
in the warming, souring ocean. They're struggling to find the fish they need to feed their chicks and keep themselves alive. I had hoped it would be a long time before the great starving would reach the Oregon coast, but this might be the beginning of it in this blue bucket. I did not talk to the boy about this. Carefully, we emptied the bucket onto a polished log. Here was the body of the mirror, feathers broken, head hanging. Here was a blue by the wind sailor, a small jellyfish with a wing to catch the wind. Here was a mudstone shaped by the fossilized shell of an ancient butter clam. The mirror would want to be buried here at the beach, the boy decided, in the place it knows and loves best, where its mom and dad are probably nearby looking for him. So this is what we did. We dug a hole behind the log, buried the mirror in sand, and decorated the grave with the treasures the boy had found. Standing erect, looking out to sea, the boy whistled a sad song for the dead bird. Then, hand in hand, we walked back down the beach under the terrible silence of the empty sky. This next one is about the Western sage grouse. Once again, a very dramatically abbreviated excerpt from Earth's Wild Music. <clears throat> Hidden behind a log wall, I have watched a football sized bird boom and dance on its leck. It was the greater sage grouse over in the Oregon desert on a late winter snow scoured pre dawn expedition when I thought I could actually freeze to death. But the birds were spectacular. Grubby little speckled brown birds, most of the time, they bloomed on the leck. Their tail feathers spread into pointy tipped fan, revealing white spotted feathers on their rumps. They draped their wings down over their legs. They shook the feathers around their scrawny necks into a fluffy white boa. Then the boa parted as the chest swelled, exposing two big sacs like yellow breasts, Unlike any breasts I have ever seen, these sacks expanded and collapsed, giving out a loud boom, sort of like boom, boom, ba, boom, ba. As snow skittered across the bare dirt, the grouse hopped and strutted, scratching at the ground. Attracted from miles around, dowdy females wandered over the leck, acting unimpressed, like the pig judges at the county fair. The males scratched the ground bare in a search for love. I wrapped my scarf tighter around my own scrawny neck and my own chest swelled. I confess it, taking in their desperate yearning. That odd prancing dance expressed, quoting, the wordless voice of longing that resonates within us, as Robin Kimmerer wrote, the longing to continue, to participate in the sacred life of the world. But here is this. For every 100 grouse that used to dance on this land, there are now only two. A 98% reduction from their historic numbers. Fossil fuel developments on public and private land. Convoys of white trucks on new networks of dirt roads. Concrete paths and bobbing, thumping back jack pumps. Pipeline routes, bulldozed bare. All these degrade and destroy the sage steppe habitats. Herds of cattle trample the seed bearing plants the birds depend on for food. Despite this, or maybe because of this, the government has chosen not to protect the sage grouse as an endangered species. When they're gone, the wind will dance alone in the snow. I should, I should tell you that um, when I write my last essay, I want to be able to say something like that, 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 that glittering urgency of ongoing life is as close as we'll get to the sacred. I, I believe that. And I believe that music is its jubilant expression 
And so every silencing, every suffering is a profanity. <laughs> I believe that it is a sacrilege, sacrilege, sacro, sacred, ligari, steal, a sacrilege, the theft of sacred things. And then I'd like to end um, with the third essay, this third little extraction, which is called Wolf Pups. I have howled for wolves before, often standing at some random edge of ice in the dark, alternately caterwauling and listening, trying to arouse a territorial response from the nightbound lake. But this is different. Locals already know that there's a family of wolves denning a few miles up the road. We don't need to find them. Instead, our job is to count the pups by counting their voices. So here we are in our boots and mittens and mufflers, the wolf biologist and I, hiking through the dark toward a family of wolves, trying to make no sound at all, but squeaking like mice on the cold snow. I wouldn't mind squeaking like a lumberjack or a hunter, but our sound is distinctly wee and succulent. If a, wolf, if a wolf were to stalk us, we would never see it in the deep wells of darkness under the trees, and we would never hear it over the rhythmic creak of our boots. Maybe, I say, maybe we could hold hands, and we do, finding some comfort as our moist mittens freeze together. We tromp along. Under the snow, the hills slope smoothly away on both sides of the trail. We walk more slowly as we get closer to where the biologists think the wolves will be. At last, she signals us to stop. Then she begins to sing. She makes a soft sound as if a mother were trying to put a baby to sleep. Then right at our feet. High-pitched cries, one, two, but I have no idea how many pups are yipping and oh my God, we are too close and we are stumbling backward down the trail. We turn and run down the corridor of snowy pines. When we stop, the voices of the pups have fallen away. The black night domes over our heads. Night wind shakes the stars in the trees. Snow slips off the slope of the hill. In that deep quiet, I can hear the sounding joy belling across the snow-covered hills. And I don't know if it's the hills resounding or if it's my own heart that is ringing for joy. The more hollow a heart, the more resonant it can become. I would make of this body, this life, a sounding board tuned to that sympathetic vibration, which is sympathy, which is feeling together, which is compassion for all the world. Let me just tell you in closing that these tiny little excerpts have been made into concerts. And each concert is a tiny concert that's two minutes long. Each one is read by a wonderful writer, Robin Wall Kimmerer, Jane Hirschfield, Craig Childs, Michael Branch, Lorette Savoy. All these wonderful, wonderful writers have read them and they are accompanied by original music. So if you go to YouTube and you um, search for animal interludes, you will find 20 of these, including one of the essays read by my son, Jonathan, about a grizzly bear. So thank you so much, all of you writers, all of you doing such interesting and different work. And thank you, especially to the Literary Arts for bringing us together. <laughs>